sing with us this morning. The 
Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who bore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty.
Good morning, and happy Easter. We've got a crowd this morning. We're glad each and every one of you are here. Thank you for coming to, to join us this morning. Um, if you are visiting with us, there is a yellow welcome card in the pew pocket in front of you. If you wouldn't mind, fill that out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes by. We would appreciate a, a record of your visit with us this morning. And we're glad you're here. It's Easter. I, I get excited about Easter. You know, Good Friday, the tomb was sealed. <coughs> Jesus was put in the tomb and it was sealed. Before that, He hung on the cross. In uh, get my get my get my Bible app pulled, pulled up here the way I want it. Oh, it went away. The uh, basically the angels the angels were there at the at the tomb, and and Mary went to to take care of Jesus' body, and the angels said, "Why are you looking for him here? He's not here." He's alive. Our Lord is not still hanging on the cross. Our Lord is not laying in the tomb. Our Lord is risen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Um, amen. If in that pew pocket in front of you is also a prayer request card, if you have prayer requests you'd like us to pray for as a church, please feel free to, to jot it down. Um, we have a prayer chain that goes out by email. The prayer chain also goes into our bulletin. And please feel free to share your prayer requests with us. We'll be glad to pray for you, with for, for them, with you. If it's something of a more private nature, there's a box on here for deacons only. The deacons will meet and pray for it privately. And it won't go out on the publicly on the prayer chain. So if you have a prayer request you'd like us to pray for you with, Please mark it down. We'd love to pray for you. If you have an answer to prayer, oh, we really love to hear answers to prayer. Please put that down. We'd love to hear where, where God has worked in your life, where you've seen God work, and uh, please share that with us. There's a few things we need to note this morning. All the kids are going to want to know this. Right after service this morning, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt out on the lawn. You know, there, there's been times we've had to do it inside because it rained or because it snowed. It's beautiful out there this morning. Our trustees have taken really good care of the lawn. The lawn's looking really good. It's going to be colorful here in a little while because there's going to be all kinds of colorful eggs out there. So right after service this morning, we will be having an Easter egg hunt out on the lawn. Something to look forward to. I hope all of you got to share with breakfast this morning with us. We have breakfast from, uh, from 9 to 10. And I'd like to thank all those that helped prepare breakfast this morning. The deacons, the deacons put it on. The deacons were in charge of, of getting it organized, but we could not have done it all by ourselves. We could not have done it with the extra help we had this morning. And I just want to take a minute and say thank you very much. We appreciate it. I hope you all got a chance to have breakfast and enjoy breakfast with us. We had a really good time. There will be no p.m. service this evening, so if you plan on coming this evening, we won't be here. Spend, spend some time with your family, enjoy your family, enjoy having Easter with your family, and uh, we'll come back next week. So, um, if the ushers would come forward at this time, we will take up the morning offering. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you rejoicing. Rejoicing that your son is, is not still on the cross. Your son is not in the tomb. Your son has defeated the devil and taken, taken the place of our sins, died for our sins, to cover our sins. And we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to do that. Lord, I pray you'd be with us this morning. Be with Pastor Dave as he brings the message this morning. Speak through him. Speak through the music that is played. 
And Lord, as we take up these tithes and offerings, we pray your, pray your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Day indeed. Oh, happy day. You know, we sing, we sing uh, this morning to, to God through Jesus who was resurrected, not just for himself. He wasn't resurrected alone that day. We were resurrected with him. When he stepped out of that tomb, we stepped out of death along with him. So let's stand together and sing Our Redeemer Lives Together.
God's not dead, is he?
sacrifice on that cross and then you were risen that gave us the chance for salvation. So Lord, we just thank you so much for that today. Lord, and as Pastor Dave comes forward to bring the message, we just ask that, that we hear with open hearts and, and open minds, that we, we truly realize why we should celebrate this day, why we should bow down and worship you every day, but especially today on this great day of redemption. Our Redeemer lives, our God is not dead, Lord. You conquered death and through you we conquered it as well. Lord, we say all these things in the name of your precious Son who laid down his life and rose again for us. We say these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Kids up here singing with it. Yeah. 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 All right. I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. We're going to read the verse, first eight verses this morning. If you'd like to follow along, you can do so. There's a few Bible in front of you. Mark, chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. We read when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James, and Siloam brought spices that they might go and anoint him. And very early in the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. May God use his word to speak to our hearts and lives this morning. Let's bow for prayer as we begin. Father God, we just thank you for this wonderful day, this this day of celebration, a day of resurrection. And Father God, I just pray that as we focus our attention on you, what you have to say to us this morning, that we will not be distracted by all the activities of this day. We'll focus our attention on what you want to say to us through your word. And Father, I pray that we will listen and that your word will have ability to penetrate our hearts and change our lives. For that's what, Father, you want to do through your word. So cause your spirit to come alive through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that your word will change us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The story of Jesus has been called the greatest story ever told. I think it's a good uh, title for the story of Jesus, the greatest story ever told. You know, we would expect that the greatest story ever told would have a great ending to it, and in three of the Gospels it really does. But the Gospel of Mark doesn't have a great ending, at least if it ends with verse 8 of Mark chapter 16. And a lot of scholars believe that it does. They believe that verses 9 to 20 of Mark chapter 16 do not belong in the Gospel of Mark because many of the early manuscripts do not have them in the, do not have these verses as a part of them. And I'm not going to get into an argument over those verses yet this morning. But uh, if, the, if the Gospel of Mark ends in verse 8, then... Uh, you know, it doesn't end with great joy and hope and promise like the other Gospels. Instead, it ends with fear and trembling and astonishment. We're told in verse 8, as I read before, they went out and fled from the tomb. Talking about the women who came to the tomb. And they fled, why? For fear and tremble, for rather trembling and astonishment had ceased them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Boy, that hardly seems like a fitting ending to the glorious story of the of Jesus, the greatest story ever told. But you know, if we take the time to look a little closer at the way the story develops, I think we'll discover that this is a more fitting ending than we thought, because it's a surprise ending, you know, and 
Surprise uh, is what the story of the resurrection of Jesus is all about. <coughs> Reminds me of uh, a story I read about a father who asked his preschool daughter, what does Easter mean? And his daughter raised her hand high over her head and uh, she shouted, surprise! <laughs> and I think she had it right. You know, uh, the first Easter Sunday was full of surprises for the uh, disciples of Jesus. This morning I want us to look together at the first seven verses here in Mark chapter 16. I want to discuss some of the surprises that the women who visited Jesus' tomb experienced that first Easter Sunday morning. And the first surprise that these women experienced was a surprising intervention. I want you to notice what it says in verses 1 and 2 of Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. If you notice that Mark mentions three women in uh, verse uh, 1 uh, who went to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Luke also mentions, however, Joanna. And he also states there were other women with them. So I believe there must have been at least five or six women who went to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning. And by the way, I think it's kind of surprising these women had such an important part in the Easter story. Because in the Jewish society in that time in history, women were not regarded as credible witnesses. They couldn't even give testimony in court. Can you imagine that? So it's, it's amazing to me that God chose women to be the first eyewitnesses to the miracle of Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> I think it says something about how much he thought about women, right? God thinks highly of women. And you know, it's amazing that they're, they're important part of this story. Anyway, we're told in verse 1 of Mark chapter 16 that uh, after the Sabbath day had passed, which, by the way, the Sabbath day ended at sundown on Saturday, uh, when, the, when the sun had gone down, the women went and purchased spices to anoint Jesus' body. And that was important, you see, because at that time in history, people used spices to help preserve the body. We're told in verse 2 that very early on Sunday morning, the women made their way to the tomb where Jesus' body had been buried. And notice while they were walking together toward the tomb, these women were talking. By the way, that's no surprise. But and when we're told in verse 3 what they were talking about. We're told uh, that they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for, for us from the entrance to the tomb? Now, of course, those of us who are here this morning can't fully understand the concern that these women had over uh, the stone because we don't understand how big it really was. But people who have examined uh, the evidence say the stone that was rolled across the entrance to Jesus' tomb when he was buried was at least six feet in diameter and one foot thick. And then it weighed between one and a half and two tons. Oh, wow. That's three to four thousand pounds. No wonder these women wonder who's going to move the stone, right? <laughs> they certainly couldn't move it. They couldn't have expected the Roman soldiers to move it either. You know, we don't really know how many Roman soldiers were guarding Jesus' tomb. Uh, on that first Easter Sunday morning. We do know that there had to be a squad of at least four soldiers guarding the tomb because that was the minimum number of soldiers that were sent to guard any facility or person. <coughs> but you know, it really doesn't matter how many Roman soldiers there were because they wouldn't have opened the tomb anyway <laughs> for the women. Because according to Matthew chapter 27, verse 66, the seal of the Roman government had been placed on, the, on this stone in front of Jesus' tomb. If anyone tampered with that stone, they would have immediately been put to death. So the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb wouldn't have dared to touch that stone. <laughs> Even if the woman had asked them to. You see, friends, there, the trip to the tomb on that first Easter morning probably would have been vain uh, for these women, except for one thing. A power greater than the Roman government intervened and moved that stone. And we're told how it happened in verse 2 of Matthew chapter 28. We're told, behold, there was a great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. So God, you see, intervened in this situation. He helped the woman out, didn't he? And he sent an angel to move the stone. And that was important. We're told in verse 4 of Mark chapter 16, and looking up, they referring, of course, to the women who walked to the tomb, 
They saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. So when the women arrived, you see, at the tomb, on that East, first Easter Sunday morning, they immediately saw that the stone had been rolled back. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it was a huge surprise to them, right? It probably shocked them. You know, they were talking about how they're going to move the stone, and all of a sudden it was, it was moved. Amazing. You know, I believe that God sent an angel to move that stone, not so Jesus could get out of the tomb, but so that these women could get in. <laughs> Jesus didn't, you know, need anyone to move the stone for him to get out of the tomb. He's more powerful, right? Than that stone. <laughs> Besides, in his resurrected body, you know, Jesus could have passed right through that stone, just like he passed through locked doors later in order to be with his disciples. I have a feeling that's what he did. He just passed right through the stone. Anyway, um, none of these women would have been able to do, of course, what Jesus did. So God intervened, right? Helped them out. He sent an angel to uh, roll back the stone so they could get inside and they could see for themselves the evidence for the resurrection. The thing is, friends, what God did for these women that first Easter Sunday morning, He could do for us today. You know, many times in our lives we encounter big, big problems in our lives that are like massive stones and we're powerless to move them. We can't do anything to handle them. They're too big for us. But friends, they're not too big for God, are they? <laughs> Just like no stone is too big for Him, right? No problem is too big for God. We're told in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, nothing is impossible with God. Friends, we need to remember that every time we're faced with an impossible situation in our lives, something we can't handle, right? It's too big for us. We need to remember nothing is impossible with God. I believe death, you know, is the biggest problem that we have to deal with during our life in this world. Death is a lot like that huge stone that was rolled across the entrance of the tomb where Jesus' body was buried. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's a big, it was a big problem, right? But, uh, you know, death is a big problem. It's not too big for God to handle. Jesus, uh, death conquers us. We're unable to conquer death. But God has the power to do what we can't do. He has the power to conquer death. And He has the power to move stones. He has the power to conquer death. He proved it on that first Easter Sunday morning when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why Paul said this in the great resurrection chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 and 57. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Rick Warren is the pastor of the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California. He's the author of a number of books, including The Purpose Driven Life. Rick and his wife, Kay, a few years ago experienced a devastating loss. Their 27-year-old son, Matthew, took his own life. He battled depression and mental illness for years. He wasn't able to cope with life. About a year after that tragedy, Rick said this. He said, I've often been asked, how have you had the strength to keep going? And I've often replied, the answer is found in the Easter story. And Mark explained it this way. He said, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus happened over three days. Friday was a day full of death and pain and agony. Saturday was a day full of, of doubt and confusion and despair. But Sunday was a day full of hope and joy and victory. And Rick went on to say this. He said, here's the fact of life. Whenever you face the death of someone you love, you'll go through those same three days in your life. And if you're going to get through those first two difficult days and you get to the day of hope and joy and victory, you must hold on to your faith in the God who has the power to conquer death. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's absolutely right. That brings us to the second surprise these women experienced that first Easter Sunday morning, and that was a surprising invitation. You notice what we're told here in verse 5 of Mark chapter 15, or 16 rather. Uh, we're told that entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. So you see, the women who uh, came to the tomb, they saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, and they hurried to get a closer look, and they, came, they went inside the tomb. When they went inside the tomb, because it was open, right? <laughs> they could go inside. They saw this uh, angel sitting there. And uh, I'm sure that seeing the angel shocked and surprised them, right? That was a surprise. Could you imagine an angel showing up, right? In front of you, right? In your house. That would shock and surprise you, wouldn't it? Anyway, I'm sure it shocked and surprised these women. But I have a feeling 
They were even more surprised by what the angel told them. Notice what we're told in verse 6 of Mark chapter 16. He that is the angel said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So these women, the angel told these women that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then he invited them to take a closer look inside the tomb. And no doubt the women did that, right? They went inside. It was open. The tomb was open. They went inside and looked. Well, they did. They saw that, that the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was, was gone. Only his grave clothes remained. <laughs> and I think that uh, the truth of what happened suddenly sunk into their hearts and minds. Jesus was alive. Jesus had risen from the dead. Friends, I hope the truth of what happened that first Easter Sunday morning has sunk into our hearts and minds. The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. Friends, this is what separates Christianity from all the other religions in the world. Our founder is alive. We serve a risen Savior. Amen? Amen. I like what Bruce Demarest wrote in his book entitled, Who is Jesus? He wrote this. He said, throughout the centuries, men have tried to honor their heroes by erecting lavish monuments for them. They erected the massive pyramids of Egypt, uh, built as resting places, places for the pharaohs, the glistening Taj Mahal, the tomb uh, of an Indian emperor and his favorite wife, Lenin's tomb in Red Square in Moscow, and the burial vault at Mount Vernon, the site of President Washington's remains. In its a stark simplicity, Jesus' grave can't compare to those costly crypts. But the tomb of Jesus uh, excels in one important aspect. It is empty. His body is not there. He rose from the dead. And friends, that's the truth. The thing is, you know, after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus' enemies tried to say his body had been stolen. We're told that story in uh, verses 11 to 15 of Matthew chapter 28. This story was spread that somebody, that his disciples had come, stole his body, taking it away. But of course, that story was a lie. A lie, rather. The truth is that Jesus' enemies couldn't produce his body, right? That's why they had to come up with a story that he couldn't find the body. It was nowhere to be found. Friends, if, they, if they'd been able to find the body, the Christian faith wouldn't have spread beyond Jesus' own disciples. We wouldn't be here this morning. But they couldn't produce the body. That's because the tomb really was empty. Jesus really did come back from the dead. He is alive. Hallelujah. Christian author Phil Calloway said that he and his five-year-old son drove past the cemetery one Sunday afternoon. There was a large pile of dirt uh, beside a freshly dug grave. Phil's son, son pointed that pile of dirt in the cemetery and he said excitedly, Look, Dad, one got out! <laughs> Well, of course, Phil said he laughed at what his son had said, and he quickly explained to his son what was going on in that cemetery. But Phil said, he said, later that night, I thought about what my son had said, and I realized there was one who got out of, that, of the cemetery. It happened that very first Easter Sunday morning when Jesus rose from the dead. Phil said, now, every time I pass the cemetery, I'm reminded of the one who got out. We should be too, shouldn't we? That brings me to the third surprise. The woman experienced that first Easter Sunday morning. That was a surprising instruction. Notice what the angel said uh, to the woman in verse 7 of Mark chapter 16. He gave, she, he gave uh, the women some instructions, right? He said, go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So you see, uh, the angel told these women to, to go and tell his disciples uh, the good news that Jesus was alive and they were supposed to go to Galilee because then they would have an opportunity to see Jesus with their own eyes. And uh, they did. And no doubt, you know, when the disciples saw Jesus, it was a surprise. Wasn't it? it was a shock. They weren't expecting... He'd been dead, right? They expected that he was going to stay dead because they really didn't believe what he had said earlier. <laughs> he was going to rise from the dead because Jesus had told him he was going to rise from the dead. But you know, they really, it really didn't sink in. They thought he was dead. All of a sudden, Jesus appeared before them and he was alive. <laughs> Amazing. 
You know, and uh, the disciples had a number of opportunities to see Jesus alive after he rose from the dead. Because, you know, Jesus spent 40 more days here on this earth after the resurrection before he ascended into heaven. 40 days. And he spent a lot of that time with his disciples. And during those days, the disciples developed an unshakable faith in the risen Jesus. And in the years that followed, what did they do? They went and they boldly declared their faith in Jesus to whoever would listen to them. And uh, they were even willing to die for their faith in Jesus. In fact, according to historical records that we, that we have, uh, it's believed that all except for one of the disciples was martyred for their faith in Jesus. They died for their faith in Jesus. Friends, you don't die for a lie, do you? <laughs> they were convinced Jesus was alive. The resurrection of Jesus changed the way the disciples lived and died. It should have the same effect in our lives. I want to share with you this morning one of my favorite Easter stories. Stories about an eight-year-old boy named Philip. He was born with Down syndrome. Philip attended a third grade Sunday school class with a number of other eight-year-old boys and girls. At first, the, children had, the other children had a little trouble accepting uh, Philip. But the Sunday school teacher loved him, made him feel welcome. As a result, Philip loved to go to Sunday school. Well, one Sunday in April, which was close to Easter, uh, Philip's teacher brought a bunch of empty legs, pantyhose containers to, to class. Now, they don't make these anymore, by the way. <laughs> but when they did, you know, they looked like big eggs. Anyway, the teacher gave each child in the class one of these empty containers. And, and since it was a beautiful day, the teacher asked the children to go outside and find some symbol of new life and put it into their container. And so the children went out, they completed the assignment, they returned to the classroom, and they piled their uh, empty or filled containers now on a table uh, in front of the class. And the teacher then began to open the containers one by one. And the students had found some wonderful items that symbolized new life, including flowers and leaves and butterflies. Hey, aren't you glad we could see the evidences of new life this time of year around us? These children went out and found these things. Anyway, um, all the students who gnawed over each item as it was, you know, presented. And then the teacher opened one container that was empty. Well, neither the teacher nor the children knew how to respond. But Philip spoke up and he said, that's mine. And one of the other students responded, well, that's stupid. Philip, you never do anything right. But Philip protested, I did too. It's empty because Jesus' tomb is empty. And that means new life for everyone. <laughs> well, after Philip said that, the entire class fell silent, stunned by what he had said. From that time on, the children accepted Philip and put a special effort to make him feel a part of their class. However, in July of that same year, Philip came down with an infection. His body was too weak and frail to fight it, and he died. But to everyone's surprise, on the day of Philip's funeral, the entire Sunday school class and their teacher marched up to the front of the church, and they placed close to a dozen empty legs pantyhose containers on the altar. Friends, I am very happy today that the greatest story ever told doesn't end with Jesus' death and burial. I'm, I'm happy today that the greatest story ever told ends with Jesus' resurrection from the dead. <laughs> We've talked about it this morning, right? The greatest story ever told ended with a moved stone in an empty tomb in a risen Christ. <clears throat> I know it was a surprise ending, one that Jesus' followers didn't expect. But it's an ending that means new life for every one of us places our faith in Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Friends, when we place our faith in the risen Jesus and we invite him to come into our lives, into our hearts, his spirit moves inside our bodies. We experience what the Bible calls a spiritual birthday. We are, we are born again, as Jesus calls it in John chapter 3, verse 3. And he says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. We can't get to heaven unless we've been born again, unless we've had a spiritual birthday. But friends, when we have a spiritual birthday, it's a whole new life. Whole new life. And you know, friends, that's not the end of our story just getting that new life. Because you know the truth is, when Jesus lives in us, it means we're going to have a surprise ending to our own life story. 
because it means that our own life story will not end in death, but in eternal life in heaven. How good is that? That's good news. And we celebrate it today. Let's pray together, shall we? Well, every head's bowed and every eye's closed, I just want to ask you, maybe you're here today and God has spoken to your heart. Maybe you're here and you say, boy, I, I don't know if I've ever placed my faith in Jesus. Invited Him into my life. You know it can happen today. You can have a spiritual birthday this day. You've had a physical birthday. That's why you're all here, right? Have you had a spiritual birthday? God knows whether you've had a spiritual birthday. Do you? Here's how you can have it. John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received Him, those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children are born. Not of natural descent or of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. You can be born of God. You can have a spiritual birth. You can be born again today. What you have to do is you have to do those two things that John chapter 1 verse 12 talks about, right? You've got to believe and you have to receive. You have to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he came to this earth. As God come down to earth, he came to die on a cross for your sin. He rose again from the dead. He lives today. And you have, to, you have to accept him. You have to receive him. You have to invite him into your heart and life. You have to receive him like you would a gift. I often tell my kids at Kids Club that I do at Rex. You've got to... Receiving Jesus is like receiving a gift. It doesn't become yours unless you take it. So you have to take it, right? Have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you received him into your life? Have you taken that gift and accepted it? If you haven't, see, then you, are, you haven't been born again. And you need to do it today. This is the only way to become a part of God's family. The only way you can spend eternity with God in heaven. So unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. So today, if you've never been born again, you say, boy, I, I want to make sure today... This is a great day to do it, right? Easter day. You can have new life today. You can have a spiritual birthday this day. to place your faith in Jesus and invite him into your life. For those of us who have already done that, I'm sure that, uh, you know, maybe we're overwhelmed with some problem in life. We talked about the, the uh, stone, right, that was moved, right, the angel moved. Jesus can move stones in our lives. There's, maybe there's some problem that's overwhelming you, right? It's too big for you to handle. Guess what? It's not too big for God. You can come to God today with your problem, whatever it is, and you can give it to God and ask Him to help you with it, and He will, because He wants to help you with your problems. And He is bigger than your problems, and He will help you if you give Him the opportunity. So do it today. Right where you sit, just ask Him to help you. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank You. Thank You so much for this day, this great resurrection day. We thank You, Father, that... Uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, it was new life, certainly for him, but it's new life for us too. All of us who place our faith in Jesus, we can experience the same kind of new life. And so, Father, I just pray today if there's someone here who never, never placed their faith in Jesus, never invited him into their heart and life, I pray, Father, this will be the day when they will do it. And, Father, I just pray that they'll have a spiritual birthday this day. They'll be born again, become a part of your forever family, and then spend eternity with you. Father, I pray for all of us who have already done that, Father. Whether we, we live in a difficult world, even though we have new life spiritually, the old life is here, our old physical life, and we've got to deal with so many problems in this world. Sometimes they're too big for us to handle, but they're not too big for you. And we're just thankful, Father God, we can turn to you with whatever situation we're facing in our lives. We can ask you to help us, and you're here to help us. So, Father, help us. Help each of us. You know our hearts, Father. You know, every single one of our hearts. And I pray, Father, whatever need we have in our lives today, that you will reach down and minister to that need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you're here and, uh, you know, God has spoken to your heart, I encourage you to respond. This praise team is going to come and sing to us. Uh, I want to encourage you to respond. You can come up and say, hey, you know, I want to, I want to have a spiritual birthday today. I want to... Have this new life you talked about that Jesus came to give us. You can experience it this day, right? You can, you can be born again today. And it, we're glad to, to help you do that. And uh, by the way, it's good to confess your faith in Jesus in public, right? Jesus says, whoever confesses me before man, I'll confess before my Father is in heaven. So confess your faith in Jesus. If you say, boy, I, I prayed right where I was sitting. Yeah, just come up and confess it, right? Confess it to everybody. And uh, if you're here today and you're overwhelmed with some problem in your life, I encourage you to come up and just give it to the Lord. Right? Just give it to the Lord. He's here to help you. Sometimes it helps to just publicly do that. 
something about it that seals our des desire to have God help us in our life. 